Hi, I'm Bill Blaine, strategist for Shard Capital. Over the last few weeks, we've seen the most spectacular rally off the lows, which occurred on March the 23rd in global stock markets. The global economy may be going down the drain faster than anyone's ever seen before in economic history, but stock markets have been buoyed by the expectation of a swift recovery, but also, let's not forget, by the intervention of central banks and governments to spend billions on making sure that the global economy does not completely collapse as a result of the coronavirus. That all seemed to come to a bit of a wobble last week when we saw the market fall nearly 6% on Thursday, and since then it's remained extremely nervous. Now there has been a massive disconnect between what the economy is telling us is going to result from the coronavirus and what we've seen in markets, but we all know that markets are simply discounting the future. So what markets might have been telling us is, yes, we know that the global economy is in trouble, but we do expect it to re recover down the road. But what we've been seeing in terms of trading has been completely different. Trading has become dominated by day-to-day -day news flow, and it's usually fairly small news flow. It's things like an outbreak of coronavirus, a hotspot being triggered, or it's something like Fed Chairman Jay Powell saying that, yes, the global economy is in trouble. Now, it doesn't matter how much Trump's minions knock that back by saying Trump uh, Powell is being too morose. The fact is that comments from respected central bankers will get noticed by the market, and the market will act on them. But we're now getting into a much more dangerous situation. We have this enormous volatility that's been created on a day-to-day -day basis by the news. Some people are calling it Roro, risk on, risk off. And yes, that's a pretty good description of what's going on, because that mood and sentiment is changing. But as I said earlier, that's small news. What are the big things? What are the big things we need to really be concerned about? And that's the real economic events that are going on out there at the moment. For instance, this morning in the news, we have BP announcing 17 billion in provisions and scaling back its global ambitions in terms of drilling. They are a company in transition, one that I reckon will successfully transition to become a future energy provider, but they are taking enormous costs, and that's true across whole swathes of the global economy, especially in aerospace, which we know is likely to be one of the sectors that suffers most long term. But we're also seeing a more fundamental shift in the strength of corporates. Many corporates are extremely highly levered, that means they've been borrowing money, not only from markets, but also the banks, which they've been using uh, to build up uh, their businesses, but also in investing in stock buybacks. Now, these corporates are changing. They know that liquidity is not guaranteed, no matter how much the central banks are pumping into the market. So they're going to endeavour to cut costs. That means around the globe we are seeing investment by corporates reduced and cutting costs means putting more people on the unemployment queues. There isn't going to be a swift 40 million jobs created in the US and many of the jobs that have been saved by furloughing here in the UK are never going to go back. Companies are going to be planning for a long-term recession. And then, of course, on top of that, we have growing discontent. It's not just the Black Lives Matter demonstrations and the right-wing backlash that we've seen in recent, recent days. It's an increasing dissatisfaction amongst electorates by the way in which governments have handled this. Now, this was always, unfortunately, going to be a zero-sum game for governments. They were never going to get it right because, frankly, we don't know enough about this virus. We're now getting to the stage where all of us must know at least one person who's been hospitalised with the virus, and this is not a simple flu. Our friends who are now in recovery are telling us about their lungs being damaged beyond recognition, about 
weeks spent on kidney dialysis and other organ failure, it looks like this may be more cardiovascular than simply a respiratory disease. Now, I'm no expert on the medicine and I know nothing about epidemiology, but it does strike me that if this is not what we thought it was and that narrative is changing, then the hopes that are being put into vaccines may be sadly misplaced. This looks to be something that will be treatable, but what road we go down to treat it is still open to some debate. And then, of course, on top of the coronavirus fears, because it is not going away, it is going to remain very important, we have all the other fears about the global economy. The geopolitical tensions that have been kicked off represented China against the US, but very much involving Europe in that discussion are going to be paramount for the next uh, few years. And then, of course, we've got the political dimension. This year, we have the all-important US presidential elections in November, and that is changing on a day-to-day -day basis. The expectation that Trump would get a second term played very well with parts of US industry. That certainly looks less nailed on today. And then, of course, we have a coming electoral cycle in Europe in the next couple of years. It's very interesting the way that French President Macron has addressed the nation, reopened the economy, and is making a play, and perhaps even an early election, uh, to get himself back up the popularity ladder. Politics, geopolitics, the threat of rising unemployment and a global recession, these are the real threats. But so far, we've been able to counter them by the expectation that central banks and governments will continue to bail out markets. If that relationship breaks down, that's when things get very, very interesting. Now, people often ask me, but the governments and central banks are not buying equities. Well, you see, they are supporting equities. And the way that works is by buy, buying bonds through quantitative easing infinity programs and keeping interest rates so low, you force investors to go and take higher risk. They have to put their money where it is going to work more effectively. That means buying stock. But we've had enormous asset inflation in the financial markets. Financial asset inflation, which some are calling financial stagnation, is a very dangerous concept. And just think about it this way, and these are just off-the-cuff numbers. Five years ago, you would have bought a government bond yielding 5%. That would have paid you 5% on your investment. Today, that same government bond is going to yield somewhere between 0 and 0.5%. That means the value of your bond investment in terms of what it returns is one-tenth of what it was five years ago. And unfortunately, the same is true in the stock markets. Five years ago, let's assume that a stock cost $1 and it returned 10 cents. Let's assume that same stock today costs you $10, but the company profits, its earnings have not increased and it's still paying 10% dividend. Again, you've seen a t uh, 10 times loss on your investment in terms of return. And it's that kind of financial inflation which is what is really beginning to cause concern in the investment community. They know they cannot continue to buy overpriced equities and can't buy bonds to create the kind of returns that their investors, who are by and large pension savers like ourselves, are going to demand. This is going to force people out of the financial asset markets and into the real economy, and that is hopeful. That means we may see direct investment into infrastructure, new companies, new projects, but that's going to take an awful long time to happen in a world where most corporates are more concerned with saving money today to get through the coming recession rather than planning long-term investments. The picture out there is looking very bleak just now. I'm expecting the next couple of weeks to remain very volatile and fractious 
as the news flow continues to develop. Thank you.